In this video, I'm going to introduce the topic of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to explain the Holy Spirit in detail in this video, but I'm going to address the most prominent doctrine regarding the Holy Spirit, which is the doctrine of the Trinity. In the next video of this series, I'm going to begin to expound on what the Holy Spirit actually refers to in the Bible. This video series is going to be about three or four videos long, including this video. When most people think of the Holy Spirit, their perception of it is that it's the third person in the Trinity. As most of us know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The first time that the Trinity is said to have ever been mentioned was by a man named Tertullian who is considered to be a Christian church father. He's a man from Carthage who lived in the second century AD. And in a letter that he wrote in opposition to a man named Praxius, he wrote the following. As you see inside of the box on the screen, it says, as if in this way also one were not all, in that all are of one by unity that is of substance and he's talking about when he says all are one he's talking about the three persons of the so-called trinity it says while while the mystery of the dispensation is still guarded which distributes the unity into a trinity so there's the word which is the latin word trinitas or you could also say trinitas it says, placing in their order the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Three, however, not in condition, but in degree, not in substance, but in form, not in power, but in aspect, yet of one substance, and of one condition, and of one power, inasmuch as he is one God, from whom these degrees and forms and aspects are reckoned under the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to end the quote there. And as I said, this is known as the first time that the word Trinity or the Latin word Trinitas or Trinitas was explicitly mentioned in any prominent documentation. primary reason why this doctrine was able to become so dominant within the religion of Roman Christianity is due to this document that you see on the screen called the Nicene Creed, which was first established at the First Council of Nicaea, which was held in 325 AD in what is now Iznik, Turkey by the emperor of Rome named Constantine. This council established the official beliefs of Roman Christianity. A little bit later on, you had the Roman emperor Theodosius I issue nullis hereticus, which means no heretics, which was an edict dispelling non-Nicenes, which are people who didn't believe the same way that the Nicenes believed, from worship in any town. In 381, he held the Council of Constantinople, which affirmed the Nicene Creed with minor variations and says, and I quote, the Holy Spirit the Lord and life giver who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and Son is together worshiped and together glorified. So as you see on the screen, here is the relevant quote from the Nicene Creed, which again is in the box. It says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. Before we look at the true derivation of the Trinity, let's very quickly establish the fact that this doctrine is not biblical. The only place in the Bible where the Trinity appears to be clearly referred to is in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, which is known as the comma Johannium, where it says, as you see on the screen, it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The problem with this is that there is no Greek manuscript evidence for this so-called comma Johannium prior to around the 16th century, which means that all of the Greek manuscripts of first John chapter five that exist from before the 16th century don't read this way. Here is how they read. And let's go over here and look at the different Bible versions. So instead of saying all of that, that it says in the King James, they simply say, as it says here in the NIV, for there are three that testify. That's it. So we have these three witnesses. Look at the ESV, for there are three that testify. For there are three that testify. There are three buried testimony. And again, the KJV and the New King James Version obviously are going to say something very similar. And you can go on. For there are three that testify. There are three that testify. So most manuscripts, like I said, don't read this way. The reason why these other Bible versions read differently and they don't mention the father and the son and the holy spirit is because they are not basing this verse on what the modern textus receptus says as i've explained in pre previous videos the underlying text to what most people call the new testament in the kjv bible is the textus receptus that was originally compiled by Desiderius Erasmus in 1516. I have a whole video on the compilation of what we call the New Testament in the KJV. Check that out. So it wasn't until Erasmus's third edition, which was published in 1522, which is known as the Novum testamentum as you see on the screen that the comma johannium was included there was only one 16th century greek manuscript found to contain it called the codex mont fortianus so that's where he got it from he included it though he himself expressed doubt about its authenticity in his annotations. Now, speaking about this Codex Montfortianus, where he actually got this reading from, this manuscript is thought to have been produced in 1520 by a Franciscan who translated it from Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And to be clear, we don't know where the writer of Codex Montfortianus exactly copied this reading from. Most scholars believe that the original Latin Vulgate, which is no longer extant, did not contain the comma, although it was apparently added into some later versions. So Erasmus's 
first two editions, as I mentioned, which he made in 1516 and 1519 of the Texas Receptus, did not contain the comma Johannium, but his third edition in 1522 did. And I won't get into the discussion about why he included it, but he included it. So throughout the process of time after 1522, this edition of the Texas Receptus was copied into later editions, and it eventually came to be the basis of the Texas Receptus versions created by people like Robert Esteen, also known as Stephanus, as well as Theodore Beza, and it eventually became a part of the underlying text that was used by the King James Version Bible translators in 1611 which is why we have it in our KJV Bibles today. So now that I've explained that, let's say that we did adhere to what 1 John 5, 7 says in the Texas Receptus and KJV Bible. Let's say we did go with this reading. Let's read it again. It says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now, because it says that the Father, the Word, which is Christ, and the Holy Spirit are one, does that mean that they all are equally the Most High? And I have to ask that question because that is what the Trinity expresses as it shows here on this popular diagram that you see on the screen, known as the Shield of the Trinity, or Scutum Fidei, which is Latin for Shield of Faith. This diagram dates back to at least the 13th century, and it visually displays the concept of the Trinity. So again, does it mean that all three of them are quote unquote God? Or does it mean that they are all three in agreement? Is that what the scripture could be saying? For example, in John chapter 17, while praying to his father, Christ said the following. He says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So here in verse 21, Christ is saying that his disciples and followers should be one with him and his father. That's what he just said. He said that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. So here's my question. Does that mean that we are the most high as well? Because remember, we're all, we're all one, right? No, it doesn't mean that we are the most high. It means that we should be on one accord and in agreement with Mashiach and his father. So instead of believing in a concept that has pagan origins, as I'm about to demonstrate, we can use basic reasoning as well as reading skills to know what 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 is referring to. There is nowhere in the Bible where it says that there are three most highs or that there are three most highs combined, combined as one most high. When you read in the Bible about the throne of heaven, you consistently hear about the father on his throne with his son at his right hand. You never read about a third entity. For example, 
in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was stoned, before he was stoned to death, he said, here in verse 56, as you see on the screen, it says, And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Why didn't Stephen mention the third entity? It's because it's not there. You have the Father, and you have His only begotten Son. Mark chapter 14, verse 62. It says, and Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Again, same thing. There's no third person. Luke chapter 22, verse 69. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. How come the third entity is never mentioned when speaking about the throne of heaven? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20, it says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So that was the father sitting Mashiach at his right hand. Psalms 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, this is David talking about the Father and his Son. He's saying that the Father said to the Son, that's who he's referring to here, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Again, there's many more scriptures that refer to to the father with his son at his right hand, but there's never a third entity mentioned at the most high's left hand or sitting beside the Messiah, etc. It's not there. The Trinity concept is not found in the Bible because it can be traced back to the Babylonian mystery school religion. As it says on the screen, the Trinity got its start in ancient Babylon with a Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. And hopefully I'll be speaking about Nimrod and Tammuz and Semiramis more in future videos. It says, Semiramis demanded worship for both her husband and her son as well as herself. She claimed that her son was both the father and the son. Yes, he was God the father and God the son. The first divine incomprehensible trinity. And that's from the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Page 51. As you see on the screen, it says the family of Osiris, the protagonist of the Osiris myth. Osiris is depicted on a lapis lazuli pillar in the center, flanked by Horus on the left and Isis on the right in this 22nd dynasty statuette. And that's talking about the 22nd dynasty of Egypt. You have some people who argue and go back and forth about Babylon and Egypt, which was first the culture in Egypt or the culture in Mesopotamia slash Babylon or Sumer, etc. At the end of the day, all of that's a waste of time because when you understand the scriptures, you understand that Noah had three sons and you understand that the progenitor of the ancient Egyptians, the dynastic Egyptians is Mizraim. And you understand that the progenitor of the ancient Babylonians is Nimrod and his father Cush. And you understand that these are all sons of Ham and they are all family. So at the end of the day, that argument is futile. This is something that originated with ancient Babylonian and Egyptian or Comitian myths. Albert Pike, the well-known sovereign grand commander 
of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, who lived in the 19th century, wrote the following in his Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. He said, our northern ancestors worshipped this triune deity, Odin, the Almighty Father, Freya, his wife, emblem of universal matter, and Thor, his son, the mediator. As you see on the screen, it says Trikaya. It says Trikaya, Sanskrit, three bodies. In Mahayana Buddhism, the concept of the three bodies or modes of being of the Buddha, the Dharmakaya, body of essence, the unmanifested mode and the supreme state of absolute knowledge, the Sambhogakaya, body of enjoyment, the heavenly mode, and the Nirmanakaya, body of transformation, the earthly mode. The Buddha as he appeared on earth or manifested himself in an earthly bodhisattva, an earthly king, a painting or a natural object, such as a lotus. The concept of Trikaya applies not only to the historical Buddha, Gautama, but to all other Buddhas as well. So as you see here, it's explaining that the Buddha has three bodies or three modes of being, which is not dissimilar to the Trinity concept that people are injecting into the scriptures. As I read earlier, when I went over the shield of the Trinity, where it displayed that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all God. So in that sense, they would be three manifestations or modes of so-called God. Buddhism is a religion that descends from the ancient Babylonian mystery system. When we read in Revelation chapter 17, they're called harlots. The mother of harlots would be Babylon or what's manifested today in the Roman Catholic Church, which embodies the Babylonian mystery school system. And so she is the mother of harlots because she is the mother of whores. And who are the whores? The whores are Buddhism. The whores are Hinduism. The whores are Roman Christianity, Islam, etc. And it says Trimurti. It says Trimurti, Sanskrit, three forms or Trinity is the triple deity of supreme divinity in Hinduism, in which the cosmic functions of creation, maintenance and destruction are personified as a triad of deities, typically Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver and Shiva, the destroyer though individual denominations may vary from that particular lineup. I'm not even going to continue reading. I'm just showing this to help you understand that all of these so-called religions descend from the ancient Babylonian mystery school system and that the so-called Trinity is a pagan concept it's not authentically found in the scriptures, but it's something that's injected, inserted, and interpolated into the scriptures because Roman Christianity is a pagan belief system. So that concludes this introduction on the Holy Spirit. In the next video, I'm going to start to explain what the scriptures are actually referring to when it speaks of Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh. Shalom.